So first of all, Sophie Thomas is the co-director of design at the Royal Society of Arts. And Sophie has been working in the fields of sustainable design, behavior change, and material process through her design agency, Thomas Matthews Limited, for over 15 years, and as a director of design for useful, simple projects. She has a long-term interest in materials, uh, led Sophie to fund the Great Recovery, a program to build capacity and understanding of circular design in the materials supply chain. And she has assisted global businesses and the UK government uh, to define the role of designers within discussion around waste streams, resource efficiency, and circular economies. So Sophie will now talk about reuse and recycling, making materials work for longer. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. That's quite a long introduction, isn't it? Um, hello, yes, I've got many hats and today I'm really going to be talking about the Great Recovery, which is a programme that we're running at the RSA with the support of the Technology Strategy Board, looking at investigating the role of designers in the circular economy. And I'm going to talk a bit about what the circular economy is, how we're defining it, but also a bit about the materials that we're actually using now. I mean, we've heard, I've heard a lot of fascinating stuff just this afternoon about new materials and the kind of innovation that's happening in lots of different areas of material science and actually my work and, and my investigations have led me on a trail that's sort of looking at how we're not looking after our materials properly at the end of life and how apparent that is and when you start looking at the kind of waste streams that are going out of our systems and out of the country. Starting point race right back. This is a book my mum lent me and I always show this as a kind of reminder to myself. Um, this was a, the citizen's advice notes given to um, local government I suppose at that particular time in 1942 about how uh, people could live in times of ration and war. And actually uh, there's a whole section in this book which is about uh, written by the uh, Ministry of Salvage which talks about materials. It's absolutely fascinating. And this whole section here is about string, and this is about paper. And the, the, the uh, order says that it's a fence for any person except hunter's license to throw away a piece of string that is longer than three inches. And the fact that we also weren't allowed to mix paper with any other, way, any other material stream, we had to recover it because it was used for um, ammunition boxes, fuses, etc. So looking now at the way we kind of value our materials and the way we design with them and the way we uh, kind of nurture them at the R&D and the kind of first principles level, and then you go to some of the waste facilities and you look through the bins and you, if you follow a refuse truck you're down the road, you just see there's kind of, as soon as it becomes deemed as waste, defined as waste, it immediately loses its value. So that's kind of where our starting point for the project. And I'm really going to race through because I've got far too many slides with 10 minutes, but I'm going to run through it really quickly. So um, McKinsey and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation did a very interesting piece of work a few years back which talked about the demand for resources, 2050, or 20, yeah, sorry, 2030, looking at how much pressure will be on our resource streams, 80% increase in steel production, 41 in water, 33% in energy. This is obviously going to affect the volatility of our energy, of our prices of resources. It's not that these materials are going to become incredibly difficult, actually, no, and reduced in uh, quantity and getting back at, getting it from the earth, but actually the volatility, the supply of it all, who's going to be holding it, where's it going to sit, it's all going to become very political. Obviously, that really starts to impact these kind of resource-intensive upstream industries such as the steel industry and the higher variable cost of these raw materials. And then that, that puts pressure on the profits of our businesses. So um, a lot of leaders in this field, as it says here, are looking at this kind of concept of circularity, how we can be more efficient with our end-of-use materials. This is about the kind of system that we currently talk about a lot in discussions around circularity, which is about the take-make-waste. So we take it out of the earth and we make things with it, and within that process of making, we have a huge amount of materials going to waste, even before that product gets onto the floor of, um, of the shops, etc. And then if it's lucky, they kind of end in this pile here. This is actually, may look like a waste pile, it's actually um, a pile of e-waste going in to be recovered at Sweep in um, Kent. 
So this is the best place it can end up. And actually, you know, if you think about the kind of f the huge amount of R&D that went into these products, probably, to get them right for the way that they get consumed, for the right for the, the way we hold our vacuum cleaners, to the way we use our computers, huge amount of design thought. Showing a design of this is really quite shocking because actually this, their products that they spent so much time on could end up in this waste stream within six to 18 months. Very, very quickly it gets into the design stream. And actually, we, can, we know that we can only get a certain amount of the materials that have gone in in the first place out again, and the quality starts to drop. So where's the value? Why are we thinking about volume when in material terms it should be about value? Why designers? Because we know that designers spend a lot of time in that concept stage. They're the ones specking the materials. They're the ones that are looking at the innovation and what kind of um, user um, they're, they're trying to focus on, etc. So we know that that's like they're predetermining a lot of the decisions about the, all of these concepts, how we can get those materials back. So the first thing we've done is to look at mapping the circular network. If a designer is designing something for uh, material recovery, then they should have a material uh, expert on their design team. They should have somebody who's actually recovering that material in the, first, in the second place, at the end of life, also on their team. They should also probably have an anthropologist. So we've started to map out who exactly those people should be, whether it's from all of the supply chain people on the left-hand side, across to policy investors and education on the other side. Our design section here, it goes from makers and fixers all the way to design engineers, all the way to also system designers because as we've heard today, it's not just about um, redesigning at a product level, it's redesigning at the molecular level that, I'm that Mark talked about and Professor Ravi Silva talked about. It's also about the system level as well, which Bernie was talking about. You know, actually. You can't think about designers just at that product level. It has to be across all of the processes. We've also talked about getting the material experts in. And really, really key, end of life. This is where our materials end up. This is where they sort of take things back. We don't really care about it. It's a kind of, as a society, we have this very much um, out of sight, out of mind process. So actually, how can we kind of pull that value back in again? So what we've been doing at The Great Recovery in the first year, we've been taking people all from that network, so designers, chemists, consultants, policy, etc., taking them to the places where things end up. So this is in uh, closed loop, where they do packaging. We've been filming everything, and it's all on our YouTube channel. We have 18 films now and interviews of people. We're still collecting case studies. We're still collecting observations from all around that network. We've been doing very traditional um, standard design processes like teardowns, um, taking elements off that scrap pile, getting designers and the engineers, etc., giving them a screwdriver, getting them to take it apart. Very, very simple stuff. Finding out what the problems are, for instance, you know, where, where are the complexities? Things like having a CFL tube at the back of a laptop, so the light, the compact fluorescent light tube at the top. Shall I show you there? And that has to come out of the laptop before it can be reprocessed at sweep. So they have to take it out by hand. And there's a lot of sort of hand disassembly before it can go into the uh, shredder. Things like toasters. Toasters have absolutely no value for material recovery, really. But actually, why? You know, what else can we, come, can we get from it? What kind of other opportunities are there? Therefore, it becomes an issue about actually designing something that can last much longer, that people can give to their to their friends to use for their toasters, and actually their kind of longevity ideas come in play. We found a lot of interesting messages, some hidden security features. We also took apart things but, which were very well designed for reuse and manufacturing. For instance, this is a bit of a Caterpillar Reman um, engine. We did a lot of uh, analysed things. So this is um, Mike Pitts, who's a chemist, who's now head of this, um, he's a sustainability specialist at the TSB, I can remember his title, and um, we were looking at toothbrush heads with the uh, designer in residence at the Science Museum and finding all the metal pins inside a toothbrush head. We also de developed tools, so these are our periodic table cards which we give to all the designers and the people, who, participants who come to our workshops. Um, it allows them to understand what's in, their stu in these things that they're analysing, but on a very molecular, kind of all elemental level which is something that designers don't generally think about. These cards also have the um, 
the most up-to-date information on the bottom of supply risk so they can work, start to work out what's valuable, what should they actually start to try and get back. And then we've also done a lot of analysing in terms of, this is uh, Howell from Sheffield Hallam with a blended iPhone, so we've been looking at that and analysing them properly and seeing actually what is in these things. Some, thi some people are very easy, um, some things are very easy to take apart, so this is a drill that a couple of our designers took apart with one screwdriver, working out what's in it. Some of the stuff is just absolutely, it's designed for ease of manufacture, not for ease of unmaking, and that's part of the problem that we've discovered with all this stuff. You know, it's, it's all about the process, it's all about the, the, um, the assembly, the price, not about the value of the material that's gone in it, necessarily about getting, recapturing that value back. These are some of the outcomes, that the kind of messages that we were picking up along the way. But they'd never talked to these people before, the waste managers. Designers had never talked to them before. They weren't taught this at college. Where do you start all this? It's very complex. Circularity is incredibly complex. And I want to really, really quickly end on the story. This is Nick Cliff, who works at Closed Loop. Um, they reprocess food grade PET and HDPE. This is how they get their raw material. It goes through a system, a very, very complex system like this is part of their machinery. This is how he illustrates what he gets in that bale. So all of these different plastics, polymers, are all mixed up together. And what he really wants is this. Because the purer the stream, the, the higher the uh, money can get for each of those bales back again when he makes that, when he makes that, prop that material back again, that reprocessed plastic. And the problem is that designers generally design things like this. They mix their materials, they mix their plastics, they put different wraps on, because the brief is devised and pushed by the marketing people in the, in the brands and the companies, not by the material, materials that you've got in there. So when we started to tear these things apart, you found that there were metal screws in the packaging, you had different plastics here, etc. And all of this has to be dealt with at closed loop. They have to bring in new pieces of um, machinery to deal with all this stuff. So you get this kind of contamination happening all the way through. And you end up with a milk bottle here is actually a greener colour than the real one, so no one will buy it. So we ended up with a kind of process of mapping out the redesign process, how you can design for circularity. We've done reports for it. I'm going very fast because I know I'm very late. And we've, um, we're supporting the TSB competitions, which are now running on uh, designing for circular economies. And I'm going to stop. So thank you very much. Well, that's certainly big challenges for people who design. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Sophie. I can just say in designing a new mine today, the first thing we do is to put a team in to decide how is it going to be closed. Yeah. Now, we're going to have to speed up, I'm afraid. So uh, that's good news for you panelists. And so just uh, five minutes each would be great. And now we've got Dr. Robert Corsi, the Director of Materials, a knowledge transfer is an industrial son he was an industrial secondee to the DTI as chief analytical advisor in the materials and manufacturing policy unit uh, during which time he's responsible for the materials technology area and Robert has over 20 years of industry experience working in polymers steel and aluminium thank you, Robert. Thank you. right uh, let's see if I can quickly find my slide Please. There you go. Thank you. Let's see if I can do this in five minutes. Uh, <coughs> if you hear a croaky voice there, uh, I'm just recovering from the flu. That's why I've sort of stayed away until now. Uh, I've been at the back. Uh, so I'm sure you won't catch it. Right. Uh, it's it's my, my, my opportunity to tell you about uh, government support for innovative materials. Uh, I, I, can, I, can I say that uh, I'm pleased that uh, the Materials KTN is a partner in this event, uh, very good event, and thank you uh, for inviting us. Let, let, let's first of all look at the drivers for material innovation and why should the government be interested. Uh, we hear a lot about new uh, 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 materials development, but innovation in materials, yes, covers the radical end of uh, materials innovation, uh, looking at breakthroughs. Uh, 
very increasingly our surveys demonstrated that the secular economy is important, materials for success, uh, sustainability. So we have materials, but, you know, doing the job now, uh, but not sustainable, and therefore we need to replace them. So the application would be the same, but, you know, a different sort of materials. Uh, we have materials that are actually innovated uh, for uh, multifunctional uh, application, and you have some of them uh, today, uh, and moving IDT manufacturing more into a in sort of a functional area. Uh, so smart materials, uh, and some materials are actually done for uh, resource efficiency, cost efficiency, there's a sustainability element there, uh, looking at the use of energy and so forth, and they're incremental uh, uh, innovation. The government support for materials is interested in all these. Government supports all these different angles. They're all important. Uh, but there are challenges to innovation uh, in materials. Bringing new materials to, 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 to market uh, goes through a lot of processes, uh, you know, from the lab to the production lines. There are issues in terms of the right design, uh, production and processing issues, design both in terms of designing for manufacture, design, designing for consumers, what consumers will buy. Uh, is, the, is the development ready for the market is it with investors, private investors, who money behind it with the company itself, who money behind it to, promote, uh, to uh, develop it, invest in capital to manufacture. There are life cycle issues. So if the material uh, is, being, is replacing something, what's the life cycle cost, what's the life cycle impact? And all that has to be you know, gone through. Uh, the metrology and standards issue, very important. It's no use developing something only to face uh, uh, market regulations or product regulations. Uh, and ben, ben is over to here yeah, to uh, tell you a few more about that. Okay, uh, and uh, really, sort of, uh, Ben, something for you. Metrology and standards are actually very important. Uh, and as I said, I said earlier, it's seen as an afterthought. It shouldn't be. So when we think about the concept of, uh, uh, materials at the concept stage, we should make sure that we plan the standards and the metrology issues along. Uh, side and bring the, the specialist into it. Uh, continuity of funding is very important. Uh, what happens is research councils will put funding into materials, but there is a gap between that and the application driven R&D where, where TSB support uh, occupies and then where uh, industry comes in and puts a lot more uh, of the funding in proportion. So what we need uh, is to make sure that uh, we do have a continuity, proof of concept, uh, pre-production uh, 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 demonstration phase as well, funding as well, uh, and the government's support uh, uh, increasingly is covering that. So UK government support uh, to actually achieve the sort of uh, uh, things, uh, 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 get over the barriers, the, you know, uh, uh, innovation challenges, uh, address the issue of continuity of funding. Uh, we have the advanced materials as one of the eight great technologies, uh, and uh, in the autumn statement in 2012, we had the announcement of, uh, of the A-grade technologies and the 600 million pounds in addition to what research councils and TSB uh, already provide. Uh, and out of that, more than 10% went for advanced materials. Uh, we, we've got, uh, and, uh, and then mo mo very, very in this autumn, we have the 187 t uh, million pounds announced as well, and again, more than 10% dedicated to, to materials. And really looking at uh, uh, capitalizing equipment, uh, having facilities to be able to bring uh, uh, materials research into, into commercialization. That's the emphasis uh, on, on that. Uh, we've got uh, advanced materials strategy developed by the Technology Strategy Board, which we can, has become one of the pillars within the, uh, the Technology Strategy Board funding uh, schemes. Uh, and uh, it's part of the uh, four enabling te key enabling technologies within the te Technology Strategy Board. Research councils fund uh, materials and increasingly well, working together with TSB to make sure research to innovation is happening very quickly. Uh, and we have innovation and knowledge uh, uh, centers, uh, IKCs being, being funded through, through some of the collaborations there. We have materials feature a high value manufacturing strategy. 20% uh, of the strategy, 20 to 25% of the strategy is very much dependent on, on materials. And developed administrations have a focus on materials as key priority areas to actually support their businesses in their region. Okay? If you go on the TSB site, you, uh, this is well publicized in terms of the priorities 
uh, uh, for uh, advanced materials, and this is what the TSB competitions are actually based on, uh, and what Sophie went through in terms of circular economies here, and the competition Sophie referred to is there as well. Uh, uh, and this is a table uh, you get in your handout. Uh, it's, uh, it, it captures the sort of uh, the budget commitment by TSB uh, 2013 to 2014 that's relevant to materials. EU uh, as, a, as a support as well. So our government contributes to EU port increasingly. It is part of the government support for materials. It's just handled somewhere else. Uh, and we need to uh, get our due, uh, uh, what, what, we, what, what we're due. Uh, and in the materials area, we've been working very closely uh, with uh, colleagues in the, across the water uh, to make sure that our, our priorities are actually reflected uh, in what happens in Europe. Uh, and the, uh, far out of the five, if you add space, six uh, key enabling technologies uh, that the EU is promoting, advanced materials and nanotechnologies are actually two of those. Uh, raw materials issues are actually being uh, recognized uh, and uh, the European Commission has decided to set up a knowledge innovation center, KIC, uh, in raw materials to address the raw materials scarcity issues. Uh, advanced materials is a key pillar within the three uh, uh, sort of uh, sides uh, to the uh, to the European sort of Horizon 2020 triangle. Uh, so excellence in science, industrial leadership, and so addressing societal challenges to be delivered by, by advanced materials. And this is, uh, I recommend you to have a look, closer look at this, but what this is saying is, and this is commissioned by the, commission, uh, the uh, materials unit in the European Commission, materials are gonna be responsible for increasing the value delivered to some key sectors uh, within Europe. And therefore, material is very key uh, to European uh, industrial transformation. Okay? Uh, and in Horizon 2020, uh, a number of uh, uh, groups, uh, UMAT is a technology platform in materials, EMRS is the European Materials Research Societies, uh, where individual academics sort of belong to that at a European level, and FIRMS is the Federation of uh, uh, European Material Societies. Uh, and these are the societies, IOM3, it's, uh, it's a member of that representing the UK there. And together, they advise the uh, commission of some key areas to, to actually uh, you know, promote and, and fund within the Horizon 2020. And again, you can read them faster than I can say. Uh, the other one I'll draw your attention to is the SEP plan. There's a materials roadmap within the SEP plan to deliver the energy uh, uh, strategy in the commission and a different number of areas, strands within the energy sector, some of which were uh, an earlier speaker to sort of gone through, again being rec recognized by, uh, by, by the European Commission to fund. Okay, and within the materials KTM, we do have groups that actually work with the community to put together all these different areas and to disseminate information, <laughs> disseminate uh, st uh, studies and uh, research activities that are happening in these areas. And Bernie has spoken about the materials and design uh, as change uh, and, and our activities in the uh, method theft area. Thank you. Uh, expect Horizon 2020 announcement. 11th of December is the expected time. Thank you. Well, a huge thank you indeed, Robert. You've done extremely well on time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have to peel off at this stage and hand over to Professor Robert Meyer, uh, the Professor of Civil Engineering at Cambridge. Uh, the reason is I've got to represent the, the Academy tonight in white tie and tails, which I hate getting into, and I've got to go to the uh, mansion house or uh, get no guild hall. So I'm not sure if I'll get there in time, but we'll do our best. But uh, before I go, I do want to say, first of all, I think we've had a feast of innovation in, in materials uh, this afternoon. Uh, both what the materials we have today and the t materials we may have tomorrow. I'm not going to attempt to summarize what we've heard to date. Uh, each, will, each of us will have our own takeaways, uh, but there will be a summary report uh, published by the Academy in the new year. One trend is clear to me in this series of innovation seminars that we've had uh, is that there is an expanding bad bandwidth uh, for today's engineering careers, especially in the field of materials and indeed in medical engineering in particular. And these are great messages for our young people. 
And I want to thank all the speakers today and all the panelists. Uh, you have contributed, and I'm sorry I'm missing the last two panelists, but I'll hear about your contribution later. Uh, we're very, very grateful to you. Uh, the next innovation seminar after the five we've had will be Innovation in Energy on the 4th of March 2014. So I want to thank you all for coming uh, and uh, Robert will have the great pleasure of now uh, finishing the, uh, the formal part of the proceeding and inviting you to go down later for a drink downstairs. Thank you all very much for attending. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm just going to uh, introduce uh, Ben Sheridan, who is our next panel speaker. Ben is from the BSI, uh, the UK's national standards body. His current focus lies in accelerating the commercial success of R&D investments in emerging manufacturing technologies through the development and consensus and standards on the issues of interest to the industries concerned. Prior to this, Ben spent a number of years at the National Physical Laboratory developing strategies and research programs for metrology in new and emerging technologies after spending time as a design engineer in the semiconductor industry. Ben is going to speak to us on helping to create a market. Ben. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I am a Lancastrian and... Um, People who know me will be aware that I try and put a reference to the cotton industry into every presentation that I do. So here goes. Um, I grew up on a, um, a cul-de-sac um, up in the northwest that was uh, built on the site of defunct and failed and demolished cotton mill. The reason why the cotton industry failed is because they f in the UK was because what they didn't do was innovate. And they didn't produce what it was that the customer wanted at the price that they could bear. Someone else, uh, someone somewhere else in the world did, and we lost that industry. So that is something uh, that we must remember uh, we're trying to do. Okay. Um, I, I, I must reference what Sophie said and what Bernie said. The most important people here who understand the customer requirements more than anybody are the product designers. We must listen to them. Um, and when we are innovating and producing new materials, we should be putting to them some information that makes them choose your product, makes them choose your material. Because remember, they're already choosing something. They've got some pre-existing ideas of what is important. So the kind of things that the product designer is looking for is proof and evidence that these materials work and that the function is what they say it is. They also need, and this is quite important, particularly in high value and high performance markets, that they are uh, as reliable as the existing incumbents in the market. And, of course, it, they've got to be available at the right price. What's the solution to this? I work for the British Standards Institution, so therefore I would say it's all to do with standards. Of course I would. But actually, it's a bit more important than that. It's not just about standards. It is about the engagement of the R&D community, industry, and national resources like BSI at the earliest possible stage so that you don't waste time almost literally reinventing the wheel. So that is the thing that is running through this. It's not specifically about... Um, the specific standards that should be created, it's about that collaboration at an early stage. Um, and this is uh, the first point I made. It's got to work as you claim it's going to work. You've got to be able to demonstrate to the product designer that your uh, material does what you, said it, uh, uh, you say it does. Um, so therefore, you may want to uh, or have to adopt standards or test methods which are already being used for other materials. And remember, you've got to do that. And it's best to do that at the earliest possible stage. For a lot of these new materials, particularly the kind of ones that Ravi was talking about, these will have new, new properties. As you've, got, you, you've got to try and convince the product designer or the people making that decision that your product and your material um, performs with these new properties. So you've got to think about what test methods and what kind of demonstrations you are going to put uh, in front of your target audience. A very important one is, remember, that the, is that of information. Product designers now start on the internet. That's where they want to find the materials properties from. But they're faced with all these issues. Um, all the formats are different. 
Um, you can't compare one material with another. You can't compare one material's property with another. And often there's far too much information available to make it easy to, to do. What I would like to do, uh, which I hope one day might be possible, is that we, make, we create a marketplace for engineering information, which would require standardisation, those kind of things we're talking about there. I could go into more detail, but I've not got all day. Um, and another one is the costs and the price issue. Um, over the years, in the last 200 years or so, manufacturing productivity has risen and risen and risen. It's been, it's been through a series of paradigm shifts. And every single paradigm shift in manufacturing has reduced costs per output, and there's been a critical role for standards within that. There's a couple of examples just in front of you there. Mass customization required a high level of modularity, which has got to be based on standards, it's got to be, um, which enables interchangeability of parts and things like that. Lean manufacturing, you can reduce waste through um, the right use of IT. You, IT requires standardization, data transfer protocols and things like that. Um, but fundamentally, what will always happen, what you will always need to rely on, or do, what you should do is make sure you do not reinvent things that have already been invented elsewhere. That will reduce your costs and your time to market um, to a level, um, potentially, which might make your product at an acceptable cost. So I've rattled through all that. Just remember, BSI is the national standards body. It is a national resource. We can work with you and with the R&D community to uh, improve the chances of your innovations becoming much more successful or, or improve the probability that they're much more successful by giving confidence, <coughs> making it easy to compare the different materials and reducing the cost of manufacture. That is everything. And I uh, hope I've rattled through that quickly enough. Thank you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our final panel speaker is Richard Palmer, who is founder of the D30 Labs. Richard's career began with DuPont, where he led new developments for the polymers business in Europe and Scandinavia. Later, he studied design at the Royal College of Art and subsequently set up an award-winning innovation consultancy in London. His invention, which we'll be hearing about, D30, is a soft flexible material containing intelligent molecules that lock together to absorb impact. It's been adopted by leading sports brands such as Puma and the North Face. Awarded the O2 Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2007, Richard is a, regularly appears in print and on TV as a leading entrepreneur and innovator. He's now going to talk to us about Invention to commercialization. Richard. Thank you. Uh, right, I know everyone's tired, including me. So the good news is I'm going to be very quick and I do have some toys with me. So um, hopefully. So yes, so I'm, a, I'm an engineer that went to art school, uh, which sort of resonates with some of the points earlier. And um, I, I called this talk invention to commercialization rather than innovation to commercialization, because innovation for me is something new which has got value, and the value bit comes right at the end and the new bit is at the start, and sometimes you want to try and short-circuit those um, two aspects and imagine that you've already got something that's worth something, and the reality, the reality is an idea is pretty much worthless unless you do something with it. So at the early stages, I was um, exploring dilatant materials, which I'll demonstrate to you. I was just looking at, the, at this glass sort of pedestal here and imagining that it would be better off on the table over there. But it also sticks to everything, so I apologise if I don't know that. So, so basically, there are... Um, this is a dilatant polymer. What does dilatant mean? Um, most of you probably already know. But it's basically a fluid which becomes considerably less, um, sort of le less, less flowable, uh, more um, resist resistant, resistant to flow, and more quickly try to move it or deform it. Whereas if you, this is even shattering there, but if you move it slowly, it's um, very, very um, flexible. So I was inspired by polymers uh, like this. But in reality, they're very difficult to make into a product because it is a fluid, hence it's in a bag. And if I leave it here, your cleaner will be very disappointed in me because that will, that will flow onto the floor. And the invention I made was really finding a way to stop it moving or, if you like, to combine the elastic element, which is the encapsulation, which is a typical way of trying to 
keep it in, in the right place. So you can all watch it now, pour away. But um, if you had something magical, let's imagine you had water, which instantaneously turned into steel when you fired a bullet at it. You c the first thing is like, wow, what can you do with that? It's fantastic. But the reality is, as soon as you put it in the bottle, it's more about the container than the contents. And the, the challenge that, that existed, because this, this polymers and polymers like it have been around since you know the 50s, never really found an application because most people try to put it in something, and then it's more about the, the container than the contents. And so my invention came um, from combining the elastomer with the um, dilatant and effectively mixing them and creating a foam-like material that was also strain rate dependent or you know, becoming stiffer the more quickly you try to impact it. So, so that was the start. I had an invention. I filed a patent application. Cheapest way of finding out whether you've got value in your application is to file a patent application because these search results are effectively free as part of the application. And that cost me £150. So I had an idea. I had an invention and a patent application. And so what next? And so the, the reality is you've got to do something with it. Otherwise, it's, it's not innovation. It's just a great idea. And um, so I spent a while coming up with a business model and a business concept. And my vision was to make the material, a branded material, which was a, the same as the consumer benefit story of Gore-Tex, which is waterproof um, but breathable. This is soft but protective. And so that's what I had as a business um, sort of, let's say, vision. And I worked very hard to, to, to write a, a, a business plan. I needed a lot of money because I wasn't a materials company and I had no money. Um, and I didn't have many people to work with either. So I spent a sensible amount of time writing a plan and imagining how that would turn into a business. And I needed about £2 million as the first stage of investment. And so I promptly went out there and sort of looked at places to find uh, investment. And I thought it, would have, it was a great product. It was going to make millions and millions of pounds. And it would be very easy to raise money. Well, the reality was it was very hard to raise money. And I printed 300 business plans. I met, well, 300 meetings with a business plan sent over 18 months, and I raised absolutely nothing. So I realised it, it was harder than I thought. I'd already sold my house. I um, was living off the floor of a friend. But what I did do in the end was I raised a smaller amount of money through Business Angels. And I did have a conversation with uh, BASF and DuPont and some others about licensing. <coughs> but in reality, until that patent was granted, it's still not really worth anything. It might be worth something, but the reality is, is there's always this risk aversion for people. So I took a smaller amount of money and I started to build the business myself. And, and really, that stage of the business is all about gaining believers. And, and one of the threads that sort of comes through in, in, in this really for me is that as a scientist, you want to measure everything. And to measure everything is to understand it. And to, to measure it is to sort of find truth. But the reality is that before you can measure it, you've got to believe in it. And if you can't find people that believe in it, then maybe it's not very believable. And so my job at the start was to find people that believed in what I was doing rather than wanted to measure what I'd achieved already. Because measurement is of the past or of today. It's not of tomorrow. And so uh, one of the first things that I did, which I was relatively lucky about, or I was relatively perseverant about, depending on your perspective, I found uh, you know, a couple of what I call champions, a guy that was prepared to put it into some shoes to launch it in, um, in footwear for skating, and importantly, a guy who was keen enough to try it on the Olympic athletes for ski racing. He loved the product concept of the ski races for the Olympic slaloms, go through ski gates at great speed, and the fastest way down the hill, of course, is straight. Trouble is there's all these sticks in the way. So you want to you get as close to those sticks as you can, and that involves impacting them. And uh, so the material is very flexible and soft. Right before the Winter Olympics, no one wants to change their program. They're all in the zone. So Phil said, look, Rich, we'll try it on a couple of the younger, you know, sort of ranks, and we'll see whether we can get it in there. They tested it, loved it, and then the, you know, the, the word got out around the changing room that this stuff was really good. So now they all wanted it. But we made that out of moulds that we machined out of MDF and blah, 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 blah. Last minute, but we, we did it. And we got a few um, sort of, let's say, believers on board from the uh, journalistic side. And you know, from, from Spider's perspective, you make the ski race suits and sponsor the US and Canadian ski teams. It was the best Olympic media event they'd ever had. They had five TV appearances and about 100 press citations in a month. And so everything was flying forward because we got some believers. 
Um, very few people had been on uh, you know, the, the, the circuit, had experienced that impact, had measured it. It was all about believing in the future. And at that point, you know, I really needed to build the team. I needed to get some grey hair on. I've got some now. I didn't have some at the time. Um, so I needed to get some grey hair onto the, um, onto the, you know, the board and into the um, company. So I built a team of people that were much more capable in areas that I wasn't. And I got a chairman who had got a lot of experience in that, in that industry. And that really helped to gain confidence um, from you know, both our suppliers and our investors. And the business took a lot of money to get going, mainly because it required doing things which were not already in place. So we had to run, I couldn't carry on making it in our <coughs> shed. Um, we had to make it in a sort of, let's say, more professional manner. And uh, we had to really make it in China. Why do we make it in China? Not, not because of the cost base per se, but because of all of our, um, yeah, it's tempting and distracting, but um, all of our customers were making their products in China. So um, perhaps not actually the ski race suits, they were made in Switzerland, but of course there's 20 of them. But uh, all of the, uh, the products that uh, Spider were making, that Sessions were making, that the North Face made a glove, they're all made out of China, as they, you know, the, those, those consumer products are. And so they are sourcing their zips, their other sort of additional components at, in China. And so we had to make our material in China, but we deliberately kept some of our, let's say, our IP out of China because we didn't want to sort of have everything made in China because obviously there was some issues around uh, IP protection in China. So that, was, that was, so that took a while to set up. But once we set it up, we were, we were rolling and we just carried on telling the story and building... The, the belief of more people to try this product because it was more expensive than existing technologies and uh, we weren't a, a recognised company and to a point at the start it was quite difficult to tell Puma and Quicksilver and the North Face to put our name on their products because it was very important for us just as Gore-Tex is an ingredient brand we are and were at the start an ingredient brand and that was a bit of an ask on day one, please buy our material. It's 10 times more expensive than anything you're currently buying. We've never made it before, and you've got to put our name on it. <laughs> Bit of an ask. So we, we, we adopted a, um, a sort of, let's say, a, a pull strategy in combination with the push strategy, and that was about making sure that um, people who were likely to be buying it were inspired by it. We had a lot of press. We didn't pay for it. We just created a, a, most, a more compelling story. Um, you, know, you can read the press, but we were getting sort of 360 press citations a year and about 12, you know, one a month TV because it was, because it was an interesting technology. And then we had to be, be selective. We had so many incoming inquiries, most of which were expecting the product to do something that was fundamentally incapable um, so we had to select our partners and work with them to build a product and then move from a bespoke, we'll make what you want, because of course we can make any shape you want, we can just cast it into whatever you want, into something like, would you like to buy this shape or that shape? You can have one or the other, you can't have anything you want, um, to, in order to sort of scale the business. And we launched with you know, a significant number of, 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 of partners, <coughs> where it was a genuine partnership, where we were, we were co-developing the next range of products for their product launches and then helping them tell the story to their consumers. I heard earlier the uh, story of the graphene in head. Well, we had D3O in head for the two previous seasons and I, I'm pretty, I left the company in 2010. Um, but, um, yeah, so we had it in there, the tennis rackets as a, a technology in there. And, I, in fact, I went into a shop the other day and I uh, talked to the... Because I quite often go and sort of do the secret... You know, the uh, sort of, oh, what's, what's this stuff then? How does that work? Um, but um, the, the guy was telling me, he said, oh, we used to have D3O in it. He said, yeah, and I preferred that. I think it plays nicer than the graphene, so uh, it's one up on graphene. Um, and, and then the, the, the most important thing as well is to just keep, keep pushing. I don't know if you've ever read the book Crossing the Chasm, but you have to keep pushing what this... In other words, you have to keep pushing the story of the technology. And it's not, it's not about belief. Sorry, it's not about mission, it's about belief. And it's not selling... I, I originally, my first project in my career was working for DuPont, selling materials by fun, fundamentally what their product did. So it's pure data sheet sell. A pure data sheet sell, when you're very early, is a very difficult sell because you're going to be much more expensive and your performance isn't fully reached yet. 
So you need to sell something to get the investment back in to be able to improve your product, both to understand how it really works in, in the application it's, it's built for, and to be able to have the R&D budget to be able to further it and advance it. And so the first stage really is about getting to people to believe in it, and it's about selling a vision rather than selling a data sheet. And um, you just have to keep doing it, and we work very hard to build relationships with effectively future consumers and influencers to allow them to be asking their retailers and their retailers to be asking their suppliers to start saying, well, where's, wh wh why can't we get D3O technology? Okay, well, I think probably um, at this point, uh, I'd like to echo the remarks made by our president <coughs> just before he had to go and get his white tie uh, uniform on to th thank everybody for for this excellent afternoon. I think this innovation in materials uh, has been a superb subject. Materials are undoubtedly the future, the future for engineering, the future for our economy, the future for our society. So this has been a, a superb subject to discuss this afternoon. I'd like to thank all our speakers and our panelists and to say to you that drinks are now being served in the two downstairs room, the, uh, the Rolls-Royce room and the Sir Kirby Lang room on the ground floor. Thank you all very much for coming.